Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're here. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. Um, everybody at all four of our campuses, we're glad you're with us. South San Jose, Sunnyvale, Fremont, last but certainly not least, North San Jose. Glad you're here today. Hey, we are, we're kicking off a brand new teaching series here at Echo. It's called Money Myths. And we're going to talk for three weeks about many of the lies that we believe about money uh, that have affected our lives at a deep level. And I think it's important to recognize the power of a myth, how a myth can change the way you think. It oftentimes can negatively affect your behavior. Um, in fact, when I was a young boy, I grew up in Michigan, just outside of Detroit, Michigan. Anybody from the Midwest in this service, this campus, your campus? Nobody. Okay. So, um, yeah, Detroit people are crazy. They are. They're really crazy. And um, I got out of there as quick as I could. So when I was 18, I left. I went to the south, met myself a good southern woman, and I uh, got married and uh, moved to the west coast. There are a lot of things about the west coast that are better than the Midwest and the east coast, right? Yes. yes. Uh, Weather is better. People are nicer. They don't think you're trying to sell something when you say hi. So I'm, I'm just nice. I say hi. Okay, I'm smiling. Not because I'm hitting at you. I'm, I'm just, I'm a nice guy. So, um, but in Michigan, there are some things that are better than California. And it's very few. But one, basements are better in Michigan. <laughs> California, we have these weird basements. Like downtown San Jose, any of you been to those where you like hit your head when you're walking down the stairs? You can't even stand up straight. You're like, stand up. Whoa, that's the, that's the ceiling. So in Michigan, though, they have like full basements. I'm talking like a whole nother level of the house. I mean, it's like a whole nother level. And in the house I grew up in, it was finished. So there was a finished basement. And when I was in uh, about seven or eight years old, my cousins came to live with me. And so they, they actually lived in the finished basement. And they actually hung out with a lot of really bad people. And in fact, one of the guys that they hung out with came to live with us, and he lived under the stairs. He became affectionately known as the man under the stairs. And my cousins told me about this guy, that this guy did not like children. In fact, any children who came downstairs when my parents weren't around or when they weren't around would end up underneath the stairs and maybe even would lose their life. So most of my childhood, I would go downstairs and there was this long mirror going downstairs. Now you could not turn on the, the light from upstairs. You had to get downstairs to turn on the light. But there was enough light that you could see a reflection in the mirror, but you couldn't see clearly what that reflection was. So I would walk and I would, I would tiptoe on my way down because I didn't want to wake up the man underneath the stairs. And I would watch myself in the mirror, and I was certain that many times I would see the man in the mirror as I was walking down. I would get to the bottom of the stairs, and by this point, I, I can't see it all, but I knew where the light was, and in front of me, I would run. Many times I would trip, because there'd be things on the floor, and I would get to the light as fast as I could. I would flip it on, and I would look around, and y'all, I never saw the man underneath the stairs my whole life. And it wasn't until I was 21 that I realized that the man underneath the stairs did not exist. <laughs> that is the power of a myth. That's what, that can make you live in anxiety and fear when you believe something is not true. And when it comes to our finances, when it comes to relationships, so much of our lives we believe things that are not true. We know this. We have seen so much fake news over the last couple of years. I, I read an article uh, this last week about a girl who lived in Macedonia. She got hired to be a journalist. And she would go in, and this was the assignment they gave her. They hired her, and every day she was to write multiple stories for Americans, fake news, so that they would click on it and believe it. We're not getting political here at church, but we all do know that there's a lot generated for us in our society that we just believe. We believe it and we don't ask, is it true? We don't ask the source and consequently we get led astray. There's so much of our lives that if we were to drill down into the truth, it would lead us to greater levels of freedom. And in our society, there are so many myths around money that we believe. 
Some of these are stated. Some of these, of these are things that we just choose to believe. There are some people in our church, they grew up in wealthy families. Some people in our church, you grew up in families that were poor. And maybe even you, you believe things about money that were, that were implicitly or explicitly taught by your parents and you just adopted them. You saw them on the news. They're things like, oh, you need a credit card to, to get good credit. So you got five credit cards. How's that working for you, sir? Now you're in debt. Now you have all these problems. There are other other things that you've believed about money, that if you took this job, you'd be more happy. If you got this amount of money, life would change. All these, these beliefs that are playing into how we see money, and we know this is true, money myths, they lead to money misery. Some of you are miserable right now with money, and it's because at the core you believe some things that were not true. There's debt that gets racked up, there's the inability to experience freedom with our finances, and we oftentimes aren't able to deduce it to see clearly what we actually are believing about money. But one thing we believe as a church is that the truth will set you free. That the more you understand God's ways, the more you understand truth, the more freedom that you have. And if you've been following Jesus for a long period of time, um, you're experiencing more freedom than you were when you started. And what society will lead you to believe, what culture will lead you to believe, is that if you follow Jesus, you're not free. If you do his, his ways, you follow his ways, it's gonna put you in bondage to religion. But I, I'm here to tell you today that actually it leads to more freedom. You heard it said before, like the guy on his last night before he gets married, what do they say? Enjoy your last day of freedom. I'm like, no, that's bondage. Get married to the right person and it's freedom. I'm telling you, 16 years later, there's a lot of freedom and that's all I'm saying. I'm just saying it's a lot of joy in marriage. Same is true in any area of your life. The more you understand God's ways and you live them out, the more freedom you'll experience. Jesus said it like this, you will know the truth and the truth will do what? It will set you free. God wants to set you free. My belief, our belief as a church is that God wants you to experience freedom in every area of your life that he doesn't want you to be in bondage. He doesn't want you to be in bondage financially. He doesn't want you to be in bondage sexually. Any area of your life, he wants to liberate you and set you free, and his truth will do that. So today we're gonna attack what we think is the, one of the most important myths, and it's this belief that money is the root of all evil. Maybe you heard that before. Maybe even you heard it said, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. It's a belief system that money is bad. And uh, maybe you didn't say it this explicitly, but you said this, rich people are evil. <laughs> you got money, must have took it from somebody. Had to lie, had to cheat, had to steal to get that money, had a Ponzi scheme, that guy's rich, he must have taken it from somebody else. This is a lie that people who are broke tell themselves, like rich people have problems. But maybe you have a lot of money and you believe something else that isn't as explicit, but at deep down inside, I should feel guilty about what I do have. So you have money, so now you feel bad about the fact that you have money. It's amazing how this myth or this lie is affecting people who have a lot and people who have a little. It's on both sides of the coin, that deep down inside, many times we've bought into a belief system around money that robs us of the kind of joy and freedom that God wants us to have. I read a great book called Thou Shall Prosper. If you like nonfiction, I highly encourage that you read it. And um, it's, it's really good. It's written by a Jewish rabbi. His name is Daniel Lapin. And he writes this book. He talks about uh, why are Jewish people so wealthy? And he debunks the myth that it's because it's, ge it's, it's based on their genetics. Some people say, well, they're just Jewish. That's why they have Jewish genes. They're, that's everybody. No, they, they live differently. They make different choices. And he gives 10 commandments in his book about finances, about prosperity. And the first one is really important. He says in order to live with freedom financially and prosper, his first law or his first principle is to believe in the morality and dignity of business. What does that mean? That means that it's not bad to make money. And when you buy something, you're, there's an exchange. So when I you know, go to Apple and buy an iPad, I am saying, I think that this iPad is worth hundreds of dollars. Apple is saying, thank you for your money. I'm saying, thank you for the iPad. When you go to, to, to Phil's Coffee 
and you get yourself one of those $12 pour overs, you are, you are saying to Phil, thank you for the pour over. And, and he is saying, thank you for the money. And there's an exchange of value anytime you buy something. See, many times we believe that business is bad, but actually think about all the people that Phil's employs. Think about the, the tens of thousands of people that work at Google, that Apple is able to impact because of business, because of the dignity of business. So whenever we believe that when we, when we get money for a product that it's a bad thing, then we start to shortchange the process. We need to believe, he says, the morality and dignity of business. This is a myth that is saturated into our culture that money at the core is the root of all evil. And I want today to, to debunk it by looking at a very powerful passage of scripture. If you have a Bible, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. It will also be on the screen. Um, and we're going to look at the Apostle Paul, who writes to a younger Timothy. And how many of you know that the longer you live, you care more about some things and you care less about others? And Paul is writing as an older, wiser sage. He's, he's writing as one who has been tested in his faith. He's, he's writing as one who's had his body beaten and been chained for his faith in Jesus. And now he's writing to a younger Timothy. Timothy is this younger leader who is leading the church at Ephesus. He's, he's leading the charge. And Paul is trying to get some things into him before he passes, before his life's over. And we see in this passage of scripture all throughout Timothy, great book, you should go read it. He talks about Timothy being secure and confident in who God's called him to be. He talks about doctrine or beliefs and straightening, straightening out those doctrines. In the last chapter or so, he dials into money. And it's interesting how often the Bible talks about money. Now, many of us, part of the, part of the struggle that we, we have around finances, and I think even for me personally, part of the reason it's hard to teach about money is because people think when you talk about money, you're after their money. Like the church just wants my money. That's why the church is talking about money. But really, it's, it's not about what we want from you. It's about what we want for you. There are over 2,500 verses in the Bible about money. Jesus talked more about money than any other subject aside from the kingdom of heaven. There's more about money than prayer. There's more uh, about money than, than, than uh, faith, heaven, and hell all combined. And so we're going to look at the value system of how God sees money. God wants to bless you. And watch how Paul frames it for Timothy. He says this, uh, true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Somebody said contentment's not paying my light bill. And it's still got bills that are coming in. Paul is, he's, he's going to drill down into a very deep principle here. See, when you st study the subject of philosophy, one of the biggest questions that philosophy deals with is what is real? Like, you know, you look around you right now, the person next to you, they're real. It's not the matrix, man. You didn't swallow the pill. It's real. We're here. Hi, good to see you this morning. This, this podium is real. You can touch it. It's physical. You place your hands on it. You can taste it. You can touch it. You can see it. But what Paul is drilling down into is that there's actually another reality that is just as real as phys the physical reality. It's the spiritual reality. And he says that there's a kind of ability to live into all the great things that God wants you to experience. And the secret of that, Paul says these, even in Philippians, the secret of that is contentment. And notice how he drills down into character. He says it's, it's, it's godliness plus contentment that allows you, it's with contentment, godliness, that allows you to experience great wealth. So what he's saying is that in contentment, and a character that is godly, you're able to stand in or step into all the great things that God is trying to bless you with spiritually and all the great things that God is trying to bless you with physically. So right now, in this moment, there's a spiritual reality. We're, we're sitting in a room, we're listening to a message, maybe you're driving down the road, and there's a spiritual reality. There's an enemy who's at war after your heart. And there's a God that deeply loves you who's, who's trying to woo you to himself. There are angels right now in this moment that are around the throne of heaven that are worshiping Jesus as king of all kings and lord of all lords. As, as, as much as warriors are playing basketball today, there are angels that are, that are in heaven doing activity that is real, that, it, that is actually happening right now in this moment. So these two worlds are constantly colliding in your life, spiritual and physical. 
Oftentimes when we think about wealth, we only think about the physical. God's blessing for you is not merely physical. He does want you to thrive physically, but his deeper blessing for you is the eternal blessing that is spiritual. So Paul is saying that contentment is that secret. It's that heart attitude that is unlocking all that God is trying to give to you. Your, your good father is wanting to bless you. Contentment is, is opening the door wide to experience all of the good things that he wants to do for you. Now Paul continues his thought and he says this, after all, um, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can take nothing with us when we leave it. It's like the old no fear shirt. You guys remember that? Naked I came, naked I die. No fear. You guys remember that? All the people in their 30s remember those shirts. Teenagers, ask your mom later. Um, she'll tell you. But, and we, can take, we can't take it with us, he says. So you, you're born, you die. And what you acquire here stays here. It's, it's, it, it, it's merely physical. Now you, you experience it's, it's real, but there's a greater reality. And then he, he continues, he says, so if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. If we, if we have clothes on our back, if we, we get to eat a meal, let us enjoy that, that which is placed in front of us. It's, it's very, very interesting to me how much research proves the Bible to be true. And what, what Paul's saying here about food and clothing and contentment is verifiable from research that oftentimes we have a faulty belief system that if I get a little bit more, I'll be more happy. So if I had more income, more money, more stuff, there'll be more contentment in my heart. But what Paul is saying is actually, no, you, you should lean into what you have right now and experience freedom and joy and peace with what you have. Studies show that once you have your initial physical needs met, like you got food and clothes, that more does not make you more happy. From $75,000 to $200,000 and even beyond that, that there is no more happiness, there's no correlation between you getting more and you being more happy. Because once you have your immediate needs met, it's like oftentimes there's always a reason to gripe. Have you ever noticed that? There's, there is always something to complain about. There, there, how many of you know that person, right? It's just, meh, 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 meh. And isn't, isn't he or she inside of you? You know what I'm saying? There's always something to complain about. And there's always something to be grateful for. We, we moved into a new house a few years ago. New house, brand new house. And um, beautiful home. I loved it. I, I still love it. But I loved it when I moved in. It had the new smell to it and hardwood floors. Nicer house than I had ever lived in in my adult life. I was super grateful until my friend got a house. And then when my friend got a house, he had a backyard. And I have a Silicon Valley backyard. You know what that means? That means I can, I can go like that and touch my house and my neighbors like that right there. Got an eight by eight pad in the back and that's, that's your backyard. Welcome to San Jose. But I started seeing my friend's backyard and now I'm not grateful for my backyard. So every time I'm at his backyard, I'm like, man, I want a backyard. I need a bigger backyard. I want, I'll be happy if I have a bigger backyard. So what's happening to me? I'm not happy with what I have. And what contentment is, is contentment is being happy with what you have, with what God's blessed you with now, physically and spiritually. Contentment unlocks the door to, to step into all that God has blessed. There will always be reasons to be content and there will always be reasons to be discontent. As long as you are breathing on this side of eternity, there will be reasons for you to gripe. And contentment is shifting your focus and your eyes with gratitude to be thankful for all that God has blessed you with. And to realize that, that there's some element of all that you have, you've worked hard, you pulled yourself up by the bootstraps, you're an American made man, American made woman, whatever, or international made man or woman. But at the end of the day, there's a lot that was beyond your control. Because if you didn't meet them at that networking event, and if you didn't have that ability to speak the way you do, or if, if you were in a different family in a jungle in Africa, your story would be different. So there's a, lot, there's a lot for you to be grateful for right now in this moment. And there's a lot at play that has gotten you to this place that was beyond your control. And Paul is saying contentment allows you to receive it. 
The desire for more, on the other hand, can rob you of the delight with what is. So my longing for a backyard made me miss the good things that God has blessed me with. So now I need to switch my perspective to say, thank you, God, that I live in a neighborhood that has a pool that my kids can swim in. Thank you, God, that I can go to the gym and somebody else cleans the gym. Thank you, God, that I have a bed to lay my head on. Thank you, God, for the fact that I have a wife that loves you and kids who are healthy. And the list could go on. When my heart leans into that, it's so different when this discontentment of always longing for more, always wanting something that I don't have. I spent like the first five years of our church's history dealing with this at a deep level that robbed me of so much of the good things that God was trying to do in our church because there was always another goal. There was, there was always something beyond and it made it so hard for me when God was blessing me right now in this moment to stand in it and say, oh, thank you God for this moment. And what is happening even in my heart over the last couple of years is I, I still wanna see God do more. I still wanna see our church grow and reach more people. But there, there's a power in waking up on a Sunday morning and saying, this is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, thank you, God, that today somebody's gonna come to church for the very first time and be eternally changed by your love. Oh, thank you, God, today that there's gonna be somebody who's hopeless that finds hope. There's gonna be somebody who's disconnected from community that finds life. I can rejoice in what is when there's contentment. Your good Father, is trying to bless you. He's wanting to give to you. He's wanting to pour out his grace on your life and this heart attitude opens the door to receive. He's showering down blessing on you. And sometimes you're griping and complaining and whining. It's like the rain is right in front of you and you're missing it because what's on the inside. God wants to get what's on the inside right so that you can experience and unlock, receive all the good things he's wanting to do. I'm preaching good today. And, um, and I, could, I could let you out right now. All of our campuses, that would be enough. Because um, it's good stuff. But Paul said it. It wasn't me, okay? So it's in the Bible. I'm just saying what he said. I'm just trying to explain it in 21st century language. He says, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation are trapped by many foolish desires, harmful desires. They plunge them into ruin and destruction. We've seen this with people. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now notice, it's the love of money. It's not money. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. So fact number one is this. Money obsession is the cause or causes a multitude of problems. So when I obsess over money, when it's the focal point of my life, everything I give my energy and ambition to is money. It causes a lot of problems. We know people like this. We may have even experienced it ourselves. And we oftentimes find ourselves on what we're gonna call today the doom loop. So I want you to see the doom loop that starts with desire. You want something. You want it really bad. For me, this is a Tesla or a Jeep. I see people, I want it, I love it. I'm like, that's an amazing car. I wish I had one. And what happens is then I'll start to believe, I'll take my desire through a filter and I can get deceived. I start to believe things like if I had a Tesla, I'd be more happy than I am right now. My, people, people look at me and think there's, there's a cool pastor right there. That guy is not as much of a nerd as I thought he was. He's cool. <laughs> and um, it's, it's amazing how I'm filtering that through this belief system, now, I'm not trying to judge you if you have a Tesla, okay? God bless you. If you have one, just let me borrow it for a little while. <laughs> but but I, filter, I filter it, we filter our desires, and oftentimes we get deceived. We start to, well, if I got it, I'd be happy. If I got it, I could put it on Turo for 20 days a month and use it 10 days a month. And I'm not thinking clearly. I'm not thinking about the fact that I'd have to lease it and pay 800 bucks a month for it. I'm deceived. So when I do, I take my deception. If I make a decision in alignment with that, a foolish decision around the faulty belief system, it leads me to a place eventually where there's a level of destruction. It causes harm. That's why some of you, you got marriage problems, you got anxiety over finances, and it all started with your desire. You have desires inside of you that are good and bad. 
Some of them, they're to bless, to help other people. Sometimes it's for you. Take care, number one. But that desire, you're filtering through a belief system. You're asking the question, should I do it? You have these beliefs, implicit, explicit, that you're, you're going through the filter and you're making a decision. Folly, the longer you live into it, the more it entangles you and the more destruction it causes in your life. So many marriages, so many relationships, so many people are destroyed by their decisions that started with their desire. But thank God, this is not the only way. There's another way, we'll call it the cycle of blessing. So that same desire that you have you can put it through a filter of truth. Oh, I don't need $800 a month in debt. That would not go very well for me because then, then I can't feed my kids. Then, then I can't take my spouse on a date. Then you can fill in the blank. But when I get into community as well, when I study the Bible, join an echo group, and I get in that community, I can have that truth reinforced so other people who are wise are speaking into my decisions and helping me filter my desires through a grid of truth. What happens when I follow truth over a period of time? The longer I follow truth, the more free and liberated I am. So I filter my desire through truth, even good and bad ones, and then I make a decision. This decision that I filtered through truth though, it's a wise decision. So now when I do the right thing, I experience the benefit. I've done the right thing, my life is blessed, and now it leads me to this place where I'm living a blessed life as a result of it. So when I do marriage God's way, when, when I do relationships God's way, when I do parenting God's way, and it's not like there's a verse in the Bible for everything. It's not like you open it by that house. It said, it's just right there. It says, they built the foundation, and now that means that God wants me to build a new house. No, it's not like that. It's the, it's the principles in scripture that change the way you think in context with the church and community that reinforces, and you start to experience the benefits of it. When I clear up relationships, I go to sleep and have a whole lot more peace when I'm on, my head's on, my, on the pillow. When, when, I, when I work hard at my place of work and I honor God with diligence, I'm successful in my career. So what happens over time is I start to prefer the kind of life that God created me for. I want more of it. And then what happens, it's kind of like when you eat healthy, right? It's like, you know, you, 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 wanna, you still want a cupcake sometimes, but you realize that when you, when you have the, the kale smoothie with protein in it and you work out five days a week and you take good care of your body, you feel better. And over time, it gets easier to make the right decision because you start to prefer a better way of life. This is the way, this is the way following Jesus works. The longer I follow him, I still can fall off the path. But over time, it's more reinforced with wise living because I'm doing the right thing. So Paul is saying there's a way to live that leads to destruction, but all of scripture points to that there's a way of living that leads to a blessed life. And my desires are going through this cycle and over time, I'm spiraling up. So here's a question. What's one step you can take to move towards the cycle of blessing? There's, all, there's always one thing you can do. Go, go read that Thou Shall Prosper book I talked about. Study First Timothy. Join an echo group. Let, let God be in your finances for the first time. Make a small decision over the course of your life, and those small decisions every single day, once a week, over the course of a week, a month, a year, they add up and move you on the path of life that's fruitful. Now, Paul is, Paul's drilling down here, and he's going to get a little bit deeper, and I want you to see one more, one more aspect of this, this whole journey downward. He says, some people... Craving money have wandered from the true faith and they have pierced themselves. You know, it's possible that you can cause pain for yourself that God doesn't intend for you to experience. God, God, God sometimes will allow you to walk through difficulty to morph you and shape your character. But there's sometimes, let's just be honest, that the pain we experience is because our own stupidity. Yeah. yeah, somebody just said Amen. And there, there's some choices that you made you wish you could go back and you could do it all over again. I would, I'd, rather, I'd rather watch somebody else eat the mushroom. And then once I know if the mushroom's good, then I can eat it based upon whether or not they died when they ate the mushroom. Someone's like, I just like mushrooms. I just, I, I gotta be the one to do it. And you so stubborn. You hit your head against the wall over and over and over again. Paul says, you can pierce yourself by living this way. In fact, um, there are a lot of people who they have wandered from the faith. And here's what he's drilling down to. God and money cannot both be in first place in your life. It's impossible. 
they, they are at war for priority. This, this is at the end of the day, Jesus wants all of you. We exist as a church to lead people, urgently lead people to say yes to Jesus and passionately follow him. We're after your yes. We are after your wholehearted, full surrender to Jesus, every area of your life. Your relationships, your finances, your spirituality, your sexual purity, all of it. We want all of it. We want your yes to Jesus. Why? Because when you give him your yes, he blesses you. And that's where freedom is found. And that's where joy is found. And in finances, oftentimes there's this war. I have watched it countless times. People who come to faith in Jesus, very fired up, want to follow him. I'm all in. And then it comes time for a couple of decisions. Baptism. Well, I'm not that all in yet. I don't don't want people to know yet. Still, still private. Me and God. Private decision. Us. Baptism is that point where you say, yes, I'm all in. And other people, I want the world to know I've chosen to follow him. You can do that next week at all of our campuses by writing baptism on your connection card and go public with your faith in Jesus. The other place is finances. People just say, you know what? It's mine, my money. And what you're saying is, I'm gonna do it my way and I'm gonna get what I can get with my effort. If you want God's blessing on your finances, you have to give God your yes. It's not not about money for God. It's not like, he's like, oh, I really hope she tithes because then we'll have to shut the whole church down because she don't tithe. I mean, he's been doing fine for a really long period of time without you and me. Scripture says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He, He has all of heaven's resources to accomplish all of his purposes. It's not about what he wants from you. It's about what he wants for you. He wants to bless you. So when you give him your yes, he can bless you. So let's get real personal here. What does your bank statement say about your priorities? We don't have any PDFs to put on the screen, okay? But that's where it gets personal. Somebody says, my bank statement says I love in and out That's what it says. (laughs) It's amazing, though, how there is a direct correlation between what you spend your money on and what you value. And if you want to know what you value, look at reality. Look at the facts. The facts are your friends. Your bank statement is a factual piece of evidence. This is what you value. And what I would say to you is if you look at my bank statement, I'm not going to put it on the screens, but if you looked, you would see on the 1st and 15th, I get paid, and on the 1st and the 15th, I give back to God. Why? Because I I want God's blessing on my life, not just financial, and I want to honor God, and I want to please Him, and I don't want to leave something so significant and important to chance. So I'm going to, like I put my workout clothes out before I go to sleep, when I wake up in the morning, I'm not going to feel like working out, but those clothes tell me that's the right thing to do. So I'm going to honor God. I'm going to, I'm going to prioritize my generosity, which is my tithe and beyond. I'm going to put it first because I don't want to leave it to chance. I want to honor God. He wants first place so that he can bless you. Your whole life, he's been trying to bless you. He's a good father. He's inviting you into great things. And if you get the priorities right, it leads to his blessing over every area of your life. He says then, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. It's so true. Like if, you, if your whole life was on Bitcoin at the beginning of the year, you, you're like, oh, what happened to, you know, it's up and down, stock market, up and down, housing market, up and down. And we can get so anxious. If, if all your trust is in the physical reality that is up and down and something goes wrong and investment gets misplaced and not the right percentage of income. Paul's saying that's not where your hope should be. Your hope should be beyond this world. Don't trust in money. Trust ultimately in God. Who re- Don't you love how on the dollar it says, in God we trust. What if, what if we, every time we pulled out a dollar, we let the, it's not the, it's not my Benjamins I trust. It's, it's the sovereign God of the universe 
who has been faithful to me, that's where my trust is. He richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. And then he says, um, ultimately, that we should tell them to use their money to do good so that they can be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Here's the final fact I wanna finish on. It's this, that more money in the right hands leads to more good. More money in the right hands leads to more good. And I, I do believe that there's somebody in our church that God, there's a group of people in our church as I prayed this week, I felt very compelled to speak to a specific group of people. I wanna speak for a moment to those of you that you have the ability to produce wealth and you feel guilty. Like, like you, you're, the, you're the kind of guy or the kind of woman who when you were 12, you had a lemonade stand and you were selling lemonade by the cup for more than they were selling it at the grocery store for the gallon. And people were buying your lemonade. You're the kind of person that you, you would go to Costco when you were a senior in high school and buy a bunch of those big boxes of candy bars and, and sell them so that you could have money to spend. When you were a kid and you had a bunch of cool teen shoes because you, you sold candy bars. That's the kind of person you are. And now you're at a place where you're doing it as an adult and you feel bad. You feel guilty. Maybe even in church you were made to feel guilty. And I felt like God wanted me to tell you today that he doesn't want you to feel guilty. He wants you to feel responsible. He wants you to know that to whom much is given, much is required. And everything that he's placed inside of your hands can become a tool that he uses to transform the world. And the real question is, do you view money as the means or the end? That's, a, that's the bottom line question. Money is the root of all evil is a lie. And at the end of the day, many people have wandered into this belief system where they believe money is the focal point of life. But what Paul is saying is that there is an eternal reality that stands outside of the temporal reality. And what he wants Timothy to teach the church, and it's so powerful because these truths are all still applicable to us. He says, by doing this, ultimately, by doing this, you'll be storing up treasure as a good foundation for the future. When is the future he's talking about? He's talking about the other side of eternity. He's talking about that this life is, is this small compared to the vast expanse of eternity that you and I are eternal beings that we will live forever. And the question is, will we live forever in the kingdom of God? Will we live forever in his presence? And will we use the resources he's placed into our hands to do eternal good here on planet earth? And when you do this, he says, you'll experience true life. You'll experience joy. You'll experience freedom. You'll take that money that God placed in your hand, and yes, he wants you to enjoy it. Yes, he wants you to be blessed. But at the end of the day, really what he wants to do is use you to bless you, to bless the world. God knows if he can get it. God knows if he can get it to you, if he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. So if he finds hands that are open, he will look for lives that he can bless so that he can make a difference here on planet Earth. So he wants you to stop feeling guilty. He wants you to use what you've been given. He wants to bless your life so that he can bless the world. Money's not evil, y'all. It's just kind of a little bit like manure. It's like you put it in one place and it kind of starts to stink, but you spread it around and you start doing things with it. There, there is a lot of good. Did you know that money can be used to help get kids from the foster care system into families that love them and care for them. And your investment in Foster the Bay literally over the last couple of years has resulted in hundreds of kids coming to families where the love of Jesus is invested into their lives. You, your investment can make a difference to, to free a girl who's in slavery right now, whose body is being sold on a Friday night through a process of liberating her to live in the kind of freedom. Your investment can, can make a difference so that churches can be started. You can make a difference so that campuses can come to fruition. You can actually invest in sending a student to camp this summer and, and change generations simply by taking what's been given to you and investing it into the kingdom of God. So God's given us a big vision as a church. 
God's given us a vision that one day through hundreds of churches and through our church, there would be a life-giving church within 10 to 15 minutes of every person in the Bay Area. It's a big vision. I believe it will happen with all my heart. Uh, He's also given us a vision of starting five campuses and five churches over the next five years, and that's going to happen. The question is, how fast will it happen, number one, and number two, will you be a part of it? See, God, God's placed into your hands something that he wants to use to build his kingdom. And there's a group of people here that God has given you a gift that's not been unleashed. And that's the gift of generosity. See, I believe that, that for all of us who are followers of Jesus, we're called to trust God with our generosity. We're called to, to make him the priority. But there's another group of you that God has blessed you and you, you have this joy about giving. And that gift's waiting to be unleashed. We want to help unleash that gift. We're starting a team here called the Accelerate Team. And we would love to invite you. So if you think that that's you, you might have the spiritual gift of generosity, we'd love to meet with you. We'd love to help you. If you just write on your connection card, Accelerate Team, we'll follow up, follow up with you with more details. Um, y'all, I know it's a little bit kind of scary sometimes to hear big vision. But I'm, I'm telling you, God's given us a dream to make a difference. I could show you on my iPad, $67.5 million of vision. Buildings, things I think God wants us to do. One of those is what we're calling the Dream Center. We have this dream of starting a Dream Center in impoverished neighborhoods here in Silicon Valley. It would be like a local campus, but it would be a center open all week where families could come who are in need. They could get money. Teenagers could get investment. Families could, could get, get other believers or followers of Jesus to invest in them. There are so many things like that that we can do together when we take what God's given us and we don't see it as our own, but we say, God, use my life to extend your kingdom. Money is not evil. It is a tool to accomplish the purposes of God here on planet earth. He owns it all. And he wants to invite you into this glorious adventure of using what's in your hands to change the world. Oh God, we thank you today for the privilege of being a part of your kingdom. We thank you that you bless so that we can be a blessing. All the way back to Abraham, how you raised up a nation, you raised up a savior so that the whole world can know. We believe that the truest riches are not the physical reality around us, but it's the spiritual reality that we're invited into this eternal relationship with you that begins in this moment and goes through all eternity. And God, we thank you today for the cross. We thank you today for forgiveness from sin. We thank you for the freedom that we have when we put our trust in you, that there's an empty tomb that that declares that this life is not all that there is. And God, I pray that we would be a church that trusts the, 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 the essence of our lives, the best part of our lives to you to experience the fullness of what you have for us. Bless this church, God, and use us as a source of light so that Silicon Valley, Bay Area, and beyond can know the hope that is in you. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen.